Hey guys, I uh, have been delaying this just because I, I'm trying to get everything lined up. I'm trying to knock out all of the assignments we have. For you guys, I've got one more week, so I'm trying to go ahead and get them done and get them posted. Uh, the goal here being those of you who want to work ahead can go ahead and just knock this stuff all out and be done. Uh, but it, I completely dropped the ball on doing this video for you guys on the short story I asked you to read, The Upheaval, so, or An Upheaval. So we're going to do that now, and if you, those of you who are waiting this morning, I apologize. Um, but I will get it out by, it's looking about by 5 o'clock. This should be, should be live and uh, ready to go. So, um, so what we're reading here is typical for the, this type of writing from this location. What we have here is, uh, it's, it's a Russian author, Anton Chekhov. I told you guys you've read him before in 10th grade. We read a story called A Problem by this guy. And it's typical for writers like Chekhov and Dostoevsky and uh, Tolstoy and you know your big ones that, that wrote in this time period, which there was a lot of issues with social class, and these Russians really like to discuss it. You know, you know that a lot of the issues of the communist revolution came from class struggle. I mean, that's exactly what it is. It was the lower class trying to take back control of you know their lives and their their means of production and things like that. So, you know, class struggle is a big deal in, in, in all of these writings. And so this story is not any different. And it's a very easy story. If you've already tried to read it, you didn't struggle with it. You shouldn't have anyway. But let's talk about kind of what you're supposed to get. Now, I do want to point out, I don't like this one like I did um, a problem. I felt like it had a twist. I felt like it had a different message. This one, eh, it, you know, maybe that I've just read it. This is the first time I've ever taught it with you guys. Um, and I just kind of was a little bit disappointed, although there's still some good messages in it for sure. So, so let's look at the background part first. It says the Industrial Revolution was slow in coming to Russia, but by Chekhov's day, times were changing. In 1861, Tsar Alexander II freed the serfs, who were peasants bound to the land since medieval times, uh, though most freed serfs remained desperately poor peasants. So, you know, it, it was the same situation with freeing the slaves. Yes, they're in a better position because being owned by another person should never occur. But now you have other problems. You know, you, you have no job, you have no way to make money, and they've done all these other awful things to you. So they didn't help them out much um, beyond, yeah, you're free now, congratulations, but we're not going to do anything else for you, which is kind of crappy. You know, that puts people in just as bad of a, well, not just as bad, a little better, but still a bad situation. So the serfs have the same issue over here in Russia, where now, you know, yeah, you're free, but you can't afford anything. So how are you going to make a living? Um, it says, still, as the nation moved from an agrarian to an industrial economy, new opportunities arose for some whose parents or grandparents had not been well born. However, among the gentry, those who could not adapt to the changing economy were finding it hard to stay afloat economically. So you do have, and this is what you know trickled down eventually, even for the slaves here and for the serfs over there, was that you know down the road it does make that new avenues begin to open for people for a few at first, and then slowly it gets to be more and more. You got to think, you know, to be honest, when we look at the at the big picture of history, slavery has not been outlawed in the U.S. for all that long. I realize to us as an individual, it feels like a long time. But when you look at the history of the world, it's not been that long. And we've, we've had a black president since those days. Um, and that's amazing that we've come that far. So the serfs here were starting to slowly see some progress. And you're starting to see some middle class positions opening up. And, you know, you're really intelligent people and you're really talented people could start finding work and finding jobs. And so that they started to uh, get better. So that's what we're finding here. So we've got a I believe she's a, a tutor or a governess. Let's see. Um, lady who just finished her studies at a boarding school, returning from a walk. Whom she was living as governess. I thought it was governess. Apologies. I'm juggling so many things right now. I'm mixing the stories up, and I apologize. But we have this lady, and whose name I'm going to butcher ridiculously. By the way, Russian literature is my favorite literature. Um, I love the moral implications of this writing, and I really wish I was better with pronouncing the names because I'm going to sew Alabama this up. It's going to be miserable, okay? But Mashinka, close enough, I guess, uh, is the girl's name, and she's a governess for this family that's wealthy. And what's happened is a piece of jewelry has gone missing, all right? Um, and of course, just like you would see today still, you know, if, you, if you're uh, hired help in some rich person's house and something goes missing, you're probably going to get blamed first. <laughs> it's just the way it goes. Um, and so she's had her room tossed. Like she's a common criminal living in a prison. They've come through and rifled through her stuff, which is just not okay. 
Since Mashenka went into her room and then for the first time in her life, it was her lot to experience in all its acuteness the feeling that is so familiar to persons in dependent positions who eat the bread of the rich and powerful and cannot speak their minds. So this young girl has grown up in the world that, you know, it, it's starting to make a way for people who have limited means. But if you have the talent, you have a chance to rise to, to greater heights and make money unlike before. So she doesn't really get the struggle the way it was before, um, but she's getting it now. She's realizing that she, she doesn't have the same rights as these wealthy people do. Because if you were if she had showed up with something missing, if something of hers had gone missing, and she had gone into the mistress of the house's room and gone through that stuff, she'd have been in jail. So she realizes now that the rules aren't the same for everyone. All right. So um, and we see that the husband is also very present in trying to calm her down. Um, because she's upset, as she should be. This isn't right. Uh this is the type of thing that shouldn't be happening in, a, in a, their culture. Excuse me. Um, and not only did it's not like the lady called the cops and had them go through it. She's going through it with her own hands. And it's just just terrible. All right. Um, on page. Well, you've got page numbers, I think, on the on the pictures I sent you. Page 10, 15, the second page. She says the mistress has been rummaging in everything with her own hands. Um and then the girl points out, it's vile, it's insulting, said Mashenka, breathless with indignation. It's so mean and so low. What right had she to suspect me and go rummaging in my things? And she points out, why would she think I did it? Just because I don't have a lot of money, that automatically means I'm a thief. And, you know, while this is written in Russia, this still could apply to today. I mean, it's no different. We, we make terrible assumptions like this all the time. Um, it, it's a horrible thought. I've got to be honest with you, I've had it happen at school. When, you know, something shows up missing and people automatically start accusing various people because, you know, they, they look like someone who would steal, which is complete nonsense. This is not the way it works. Uh, and almost every single time that's happened, we found out later that, that, that this person just lost it or there was a mix up or someone and they, they didn't suspect stole it. And rarely has it ever been the person you thought it was. Uh, it's just ridiculous when this kind of thing occurs. This is back in the 1800s and we're still doing it here 150 years later. 50s, 50, yeah, 150, 160 years later. Um, says Mashinka threw herself on the bed and sobbed bitterly. Never in her life had she been subjected to such an outrage. Never had she been so deeply insulted. <coughs> Sorry. She, well-educated, refined, the daughter of a teacher was suspected of theft. She had been searched like a streetwalker. She could not imagine a greater insult, and to this feeling of resentment was added an oppressive dread of what would come next. All sorts of absurd ideas came into her mind. If they could suspect her of theft, well, then they might arrest her and search her, then lead her through the street with an escort of soldiers, cast her into a dark, cold cell with mice and wood lice, exactly like the dungeon in which Prince Tur oh, man, Tarakinov was imprisoned. Who would stand up for her? They, and skipping a little, says they could do what they liked with her. So she realizes at this point that her intelligence and her ability and her moral standing have no no bearing on this situation because, well, she's not part of the upper class. So she's automatically assumed to be deficient in some way. And um, this was, again, a very common thing that the t writers all over the world in this time period wrote about, but definitely writers in Russia, because you did have this, this situation with this class struggle and it still exists today. And let me tell you guys something I've worked with, you know, uh, people from all of the, if you want to break things into the three major uh, economic classes, socioeconomic classes, lower, middle, and upper class, and I've worked with all three. And let me tell you something, morality is static in those three groups. You have poor people who have better morals than rich people, while you also have rich people with excellent morals. I mean, morality doesn't seem to revolve around your bank account. It, it's it, There's more that goes into that. So you can have a poor person who, even a homeless person living on the street who has great morals and, you know, who, you could give $100 and say, hey, can you hold on to this for me? I'll be right back. Walk out and come back and they'd still be there. There are people that are that way in all groups. There are also evil, deceitful people in all groups. So really the fact that we assign it to social class or ethnic class and stuff is ridiculous and shouldn't occur. All right, so back to the story, though. This poor girl realizes that, you know, this is a coming-of-age type of story where this girl who's very young and very naive is starting to realize that no matter what she is and what she's made herself, she's still uh, burdened by stuff that she really can't control. All right? Um, so the husband's still talking. Um, he says... I think this is him talking. 
No, this is a doctor. He says, let us forget the brooch. Health is worth more than 2,000 rubles. So, and again, I don't have a trans... Uh, transition thing here. I can tell you how much 2,000 rubles would have been in that time period in U.S. dollars and then applying inflation today. Well, excuse me. Um, God, for the most part, you look at, you know, any piece of jewelry while it has a lot of value, this woman is not going to be broken by this. It's not going to bankrupt her. And yet she's still angry about it because it's not about the thing being stolen. It's about the indignation of being stolen from that is throwing her at this point. And that's what she even says. She says, it's not the 2000 I regret, answer the lady, and a big tear roll down her cheek. It's the fact that revolts me, itself that revolts me. I cannot put up with thieves in my house. I don't regret it. I regret nothing. But to steal from me is such ingratitude. That's how they repay me for my kindness. So she's thinking that. She's been mistreated here, uh, that someone stole from her after all of her kindness. But let me tell you something real quick. It's the same idea we see today when people are like, well, you should be thankful that, you know, we gave you a job. Why are you acting like this? Well, here's the thing. You gave me a job and I work for a salary. So we're both trading off something. The fact that you gave me the job doesn't really mean that you have any right to mistreat me afterwards. And that's kind of the situation. She's, this woman's like, I did her a favor by hiring her on. Well, she's doing something for that job. She's not just getting a paycheck for nothing. She's working for it. So yes, it was nice of you to offer her that job. But as far as there being this, this, this she still owes you for it is a ridiculous thought. And she points out that that's just this ingratitude. Well, obviously, this woman is not a good person. You can imagine she's treated her like crap ever since she hired her or like she's some sort of subclass. And so there's really no gratitude owed to her at this point. Um, but she's acting like I did her such a favor to, for her to steal from me. First of all, there's no proof she stole from her. And so that's also quite aggravating. All right. Um, the husband points out what need was there to search her room, how out of place it was. Well, I didn't say she took the brooch, said Fedosia Vas, blah, 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 I don't know. What can you answer for her? To tell the truth, I haven't much confidence in these learned paupers. Now look at that word, learned paupers. She's basically saying she's still a peasant. She just happens to have an education. So she's, again, stereotyping, okay? This is the same thing as assuming ethnic things. Like you, every person who's a white person does this or every person who's Asian does this. This is that same kind of nonsense. All right. Um, and we do it with socioeconomic classes as quickly as we do with ethnic classes. All right. Um, he says it was really unsuitable, Fenya. Excuse me, Fenya, but you've no kind of legal uh, right to make a search. Now, if you've already read the book or this story, which I'm hoping you have, you already know the twist here. And let me go ahead and spoil it. The husband stole the brooch. That's why he's being so careful to say, no, no, no. Now, you, good for him, at least. he's not. It's easy to pin it on this girl if you wanted to. He's trying to get his wife to calm down here. And we find out in a minute, and I think this is kind of the what makes this story worth studying, is the husband's getting mistreated, too, and he's part of this upper class. And he's still getting just destroyed by this woman. She is running over him ragged constantly, and it's his money and his family's money, and she's just you know, decided it's hers now. So uh, it's not just the poor being victimized by this by these people. It's the wealthy, too. Um, let's see what else we've got here. It says, if only it were God's will that Fedosia Vasilien, then uh, I'm sorry, guys, I really wish I could pronounce that, should come to ruin and wander about begging and should taste all the horrors of poverty and dependence and that Mashenko, who whom she insulted might give her alms. Oh, she could only come in for a big fortune, could buy a carriage and could drive noisily past the window, nosily, no noisily past the windows so as to be envied by that woman. So this is our governess thinking, if only this woman knew what it was like to be me and go through what I have to go through. And if I could one day show her pity and let her know how bad it feels to be pitied by another person and then to be treated like it's, you owe them something because they did something for you. So she's really upset. Um, so like I said, eventually the husband comes in, admits he took it. Um, let's see if I can find the section where he says something about it. Uh, I'm wanting to find out where it said something about how she treats his, him. I'm striking out though here, guys. I've got a bunch of highlights in the book, but none of them are that apparently. Um, so let's just get to the ending here. He says, uh, he stood in the pitiful position of a dependent and hanger on even with servants and his apology meant nothing either. Um, she's talking about the guy here. He says, he's, this man is of absolutely no significance in the household. So he doesn't even have any uh, place in this situation to where he's treated the same way she is, to be honest with you. He's got a little bit more voice maybe. 
Um, says, hmm, you say nothing. That's not enough for you. In that case, I will apologize for my wife. In my wife's name, she behaved tactlessly. I admit it as a gentleman. Uh, so he's like, okay, well, will you accept an apology from me? And obviously this woman's got some pride, and she's like, no, I'm not going to accept an apology from you. Your wife needs to apologize. Um, so, okay, let's keep going. Um, here it is. He says, your pride is wounded, and there you've been crying and packing up to go, but I have pride too, and you do not spare it. Or do you want me to tell you what I would not tell the uh, confession? Do you? Listen, you want me to tell you what I won't tell the priest on my deathbed? Mashenka made no answer. I took my wife's brooch. Nikolai Sergeich said quickly, is that enough now? Are you satisfied? Yes, I took it. But of course, I count on your discretion. For God's sake, not a word, not half of a hint to anyone. Now, I may have imagined, I thought somewhere in the story I read that this, it was like this man was the one who had the money. She married into it. But apparently that's not the case totally. I don't know. Um, but he tells her, he's like, look, I'm not going to tell anyone but you. I stole this. All right. Now, he says, I'm a proud person and I did this. And she's a proud person. She's about to quit. And this is where we see, and in your book even had this question, which is a pretty good one, actually, a difference in the two forms of pride in this story. You know, you've got the woman whose pride is that I'm not going to be mistreated and I'm not going to be accused of things I'm not. So I don't want to stay here. So she quits and leaves. And then you got the husband who also feels slighted, but instead of being up front and saying something about it, decides to do something deceitful. You know, his wife's um, not giving him, you know, any kind of money for himself. So he just steals from her. And also because he knows it'll bother her. So these are very two different types of pride. And that's what you look at here with these classes. And this is something that you can even apply today. If we really want to stereotype the pride out of, in the three three classes is very different. And whether it's the lower class, the middle and the upper class, the types of pride are very different. You know, you look in the lower class and the pride is is it's in honesty, it's a lot more noble than it is in the upper two classes. You know, a lot of people in the middle and upper class, their pride is in about an appearance that isn't who they are really some of the time. Now, of course, you see that in lower class, too. But this idea is, is that, you know, I'm proud of who I am and you're going to respect me versus, well, I am the son of so and so and you're going to respect me for that. There's a different reasons for that. There's different types of respect. And uh, what we see here is that the lower class person is showing the kind that you would like to see, you know, quit when you're mistreated. That makes sense. Even when she's going to have a hard time finding a job otherwise. But this other guy, when he's mistreated, he decides to rely on, I don't know, doing what they expected the lower class to do. You know, we look at these kind of groupings and you see constantly people in the upper and middle class behaving poorly, then doing things that you associate with the lower class, doing criminal things. And you often will see people in the lower class bending over backwards to help each other. Now, that doesn't mean that that. There's not in people in the upper and middle class who do amazing things to help each other. Not even close. There's a ton of them that do a lot of good. And there's tons of people in the lower class that do bad. But the fact is, is that these classes that we've established by, on a bank account, it's ridiculous. It, morality is something that is developed through other means, not through how much money you have in a bank account. In fact, we've seen over and over that the more you have, the easier it is to be corrupt because you have the means to do these things. All right. So, you know, it just seems kind of odd that we associate good morals and proper you know, behavior with the wealthy. And as your bank account gets lower, so does your moral compass. That's just that's just ridiculous. Um, so here we go. Top of the last page, 1020. He says, it's nothing to wonder at Nikolai Sergeyevich went on after a pause. It's an everyday story. I need money and she won't give it to me. It was my father's money that bought this house and everything you know. It's all mine. The brooch belonged to my mother, and it's all mine. So I was right. I knew that was in here. Uh, it's just I hadn't gotten to this page yet. And she took it, took possession of everything. I can't go to law with her, you'll admit. I beg you most earnestly, overlook it. Stay on. Uh, then he says something in Latin, which means to understand all is to forgive all. Will you say? He, he's trying to convince this woman to stay. He, he doesn't want her to leave. Um, and he's basically telling her, now that you understand why I did it, perhaps she'll stay and, you know, this will all blow over. This woman's got her pride and she says no. I mean, she's going to leave. Um, you know, the very last line of the whole story is half an hour later she was on her way. So um, by the time this is over, we have respect for one person in the household. And it's this girl, Mashenka, who, you know, says my pride is worth more to me than this job and I'm not going to put up with it. And she leaves. Um, and good for her. Uh so, you know, what are we supposed to get out of this? Well, nothing. We were really supposed to compare this with hard times and the way that people in the lower class are often treated. Now, when you look at hard times, you're like, who are the lower class? Well, if you read the book, uh, several of the students are. Um, and the way class bleeds into how we're treated. Um, you know, uh, 
I would love you guys to read this book. I actually debated putting it on reading for my next year, like not summer reading or something. I want to read it with you guys, but um, I, you know, I, I took it off at the last minute in, in favor of something else. But uh, we find out that the upper class, this Mr. Grade Grind, his children turn out terrible. Um, they don't do well. And again, it's having money does not mean you have bought morality. Um, it means you, you know, have more resources, and that's great. And you can do amazing things and amazing and great things with it. And plenty of rich people have. But you also can be just as corrupt as someone with no money. You know, the money doesn't make you in any way morally superior. And that's kind of what we're dealing with here. And then we also would see, you know, what, what's associated with the upper class? Well, I mean, the two big things are education and money. So we've tackled both of those in this week's lessons. We've got the money one here and hard times gave you the education one. And we learned that even that, having a great education, being smart and, you know, uh, being able to say, I know a lot of stuff, once again, doesn't make you morally superior to someone who is completely ignorant. <laughs> in fact, once again, I think the argument can be made that being wealthy and educated in a lot of ways can cause you more damage. And that's kind of what we're seeing through these two stories. Now, next week, last week I'll have you guys. Let me tell you what we're going to do. We're going to look at three of the poets that I really like that are in here that are left. I kind of wanted to get away from poetry, but I think it'll be easier. And I think it can be more enjoyable because there's some good ones out there. So we're going to look at these two or three. I haven't decided. I know two I want to do. I'm debating adding in a third one. Um, and let me let you guys get you, let you guys in on something. I'm not going to give you a test over this stuff. You still have to do the daily assignments. And here's what we're going to do. Those of you who look at your grades and you see third and fourth quarter and you see your average and you can do this, it's a 50-50 split. You add them together and divide them by two. That's your grade. Once you know what you've got, we'll get to Thursday or Friday. If one of you want, if you want to take the t a test, if you need the points, I'll make you one. Just you, that those one or two of you that need it, Okay. Um, only the people who ask will be given an assignment like that. The rest of you are done with your assessments. You got two grades from me. It was the legacy paper, which if you did it on time and you put any kind of effort into it, it was a B automatically, basically, uh, because it's a personal essay. And I can't really say you didn't do this right. Um, now, some of you may do lower because you didn't write enough or what you wrote was just subpar. But for the most part, that was a B. And then you had the other tests, which most of you who turned it in did fairly well. Now, what I want to encourage you to do next week is get everything done. Any of you who have zeros, knock them out and let's see where you sit and then see if you need a test or not. And if you do, I will come up with something for you. All right. So sorry again that this was late. I'm going to get it to you. I'm going to try to get the rest of it out early um, so you can go ahead and get this done and figure out where you sit. Um, if you need help figuring out grades for my class or for others, let me know. We'll work on it. And um Let's let's close strong, man. Let's get you guys graduated, and let's get this part of, of your life closed and moved moved on to bigger and better things. Okay, uh, not that I'm ready to see you go, uh, especially not the way we've had to end this. But I'd like to see uh, I'd like you all to graduate. I think we've gotten most of you out of the woods at this point, but let's make sure. All right. Okay. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you for watching this. The five or six of you that did, and uh, thank you for the one or two who stayed to the end. All right. Um, I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. And I'm looking forward to making these last few videos for you. All right. Uh, enjoy your time. If you have any questions about the questions, get up with me. All right. Take care.